I'm Monica Gorman, and I am moderating on behalf of IFIAD, and I'd like to welcome all of you to today's uh, webinar. Um, the title is Leaving No One Behind, Marginalization and Equity in Food and Nutrition Policy and Practice. And our guest speaker today is Jody Harris, who is an Associate Research Fellow with the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. Now, Jody is joining us from Thailand. Um, uh, today, so she's in a warmer place than most of us are. Um, Jodi is an academic. She researches politics and e ethics of equitable food and nutrition policy. She's also the convener of the Food Equity Centre at the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. And that uh, centre brings together researchers, policymakers and practitioners to collaborate in developing solutions to the inequities in the food system. She's a global research lead for the People-Centered Food Systems Project at Columbia University in the USA, which is looking at ways to integrate human rights and social equity into food system policy and action. So I think it's going to be a very interesting talk today. Um, some of you are uh, have a long association with IFIAD and some of you are new to IFIAD. So for those who are new to IFIAD, it is the Irish Forum for International Agricultural Development, a voluntary multidisciplinary platform that brings together actors from the agri-food sector, sharing knowledge and good practice for the benefit of agricultural development programming and policy support. Um, as I say, uh, IFIAD tries to capitalise on Ireland's excellence in agri-food sector, brings together researchers, policymakers and practitioners with a view to strengthening the research policy practice interface and maximising how Ireland can contribute to agricultural driven poverty reduction in developing countries. So um, before I hand over to Jodie, we would really like to encourage you to ask questions and make comments. So uh, when Jody has finished her presentation, can I ask you maybe to raise your hands so that I can spot who'd, who'd like to come in? Uh, or if you want to put comments into the comment box either, that's also uh, great. So Jody, I'll hand over to you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Monica. And, and thanks so much for, for having me. Um, so yes, coming from a rather academic um, background, I guess I want to give that as a caveat, but having worked in development for, for various NGOs and things in the past, so trying to kind of the, um, the research and practice as if he had, uh, it does. So today I'm going to draw on a few big reports and papers um, that I've been involved in over the past few years to uh, pull together a talk about equity in food systems. So looking at um, the ideas that underpin equity so that we all know where this is coming from, at least in our work, um, what we know about equity in food systems through research, and then also what we can do to work towards um, food justice with a more sort of practical lens, but based on, um, on that evidence. So if I can get this to work. So if you can only stay for five minutes before you leave, uh, here's my main point. So we know, of course, everyone in this room, I'm sure, knows that food systems are currently not delivering food security and good nutrition for all. For many of us, they are, um, but, but not for all. And classically, of course, it's the most marginalized groups in a given society who are the most malnourished, the most food insecure. So we need to acknowledge that. We need to understand who is marginalized and why and how in different contexts in order to sustainably improve food systems and malnutrition. And that pattern plays out in most locations. Uh, and it plays out for a variety of kind of axes of, of marginalization. So whether you're poor, where you live, what your gender is, whether you've been able to access education, and all of those are a, a function of how your social identity is seen in the context where you live. So we know those issues underpin malnutrition. I'll talk more about how we know it later. Um, we have some disaggregated outcome data, a little bit of it's on this slide, but we don't have enough, uh, as, as you'll see. Um, but really, this is an issue that's been frustratingly under-researched and until recently, for food and nutrition at least, perhaps under-theorised as well um, in nutrition and yeah, in the food systems field. 
So that's why we care about equity or why I work on equity. Um, and that's my main point. And I'll spend the next little time trying to lay out um, a bit of detail on that. So, yeah, recognizing that inequality and inequity are absolutely key to food and nutrition. Um, various of us over the last few years have spent time um, trying to work on the theory, the research and the practice that would improve our understanding and, and action on those issues. So I'm going to be drawing on these different reports in particular um, today um, and the history of the research and the thinking that went into them um, in this presentation. So first of all, I'm just going to talk about some of the ideas that underpin the, the research and actions that I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to assume that the audience here knows what a food system is um, and how complex it is and what it comprises all the way from inputs and production through food environments to those nutrition, environmental and livelihood outcomes. So um, I'm sure you've all seen, seen this and variations of it. So the Sustainable Development Goals, which everyone I'm sure knows about as well, contain targets to improve aspects of, of lots of those things in the food system um, and related to the food system. And the goals are obviously a roadmap that places emphasis on this leaving no one behind in the, in the, the sort of rush for development. Leaving no one behind obviously implies a focus on equal outcomes, sure but also equitable processes in achieving those development indicators. Whereas, of course, what's often seen in practice is active marginalization of certain groups in different contexts, driving inequities that shape unequal outcomes, and then also limit the global uh, national mm -hmm. and personal progress. So marginalization really is the key concept that underpins inequity. So uh, a dictionary definition is the treatment of a person, group or concept as insignificant or peripheral. And we might be quite familiar with some aspects of marginalization, things like the disempowerment of women, uh, the exclusion of poorer groups. Um, there are obviously lots of other axes of marginalization, things like age, ethnicity, disability, sexuality, geographic marginalization that may well be relevant in, in some or most contexts, depending on the social context. And of course, the interactions between those different aspects of marginalization also matter. So um, we call that intersectionality, and I'll again talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then the sort of structural issues of marginalization, inequitable access to basic services and resources and political redressal, um, power relations, social norms, those are even more fundamental in shaping who gets to do and be what in different societies. So all of those sort of list of issues are central to equity, um, as, as we'll see as well. Um, and crucially, also, it's the rights of these groups of people that are most often not assured. So I'm going to bring in a little bit of uh, work on human rights as well. So perhaps the opposite of, of marginalization is justice. Um, arguably, uh, justice in food systems or for food security and nutrition is, is what a lot of people are aiming for with the work that we all do. So we draw quite a lot on this work by a woman called Nancy Fraser, um, along with others, mm -hmm. and she talks about three faces of, of justice. So um, recognitional justice, which is often seen as sort of cultural recognition, ensuring that it's recognized that certain groups are marginalized in certain contexts. Uh, representational justice, so making sure that those marginalized groups can actually participate in making the rules that affect them. And then distributive justice, which is often seen as economic distribution, who gets what, um, but it could also be distribution of opportunities, who gets to do or be what. So those ideas have been applied by lots of researchers before us, and you can see a couple of examples here. And what we wanted to do is think about how they apply in, in food systems and, and be treated equally. And talking about equity and equality is therefore very value laden, right? It's based on how we think the world should be, um, but no more so than aiming for something like economic growth or human rights, which are also choices based on 
value systems. Um, what it does mean, the fact that those are um, sort of value laden, is that different people are going to prioritise different aspects of equity or equality, or in some cases, not prioritise them at all. So I just want to point out that, like most kind of ideas or philosophical ideas, equity and equality are they're contested concepts. I couldn't give you a single definition that everyone would agree with. Um, but what I'm doing here is just giving you a sense of um, what we think they're based on and how we use them and apply them in, in our food systems work. Um, so just to be clear on the distinction in our work and in what I'm going to say today, we say that inequalities are the observed differences in outcomes or related food systems outcomes between different individuals or groups based on those social or economic positions that I talked about. While inequities are the socially, economically, or politically driven why, reasons why systemic differences in, in those opportunities or distributions exist. So the sort of the deeper reasons why a woman or a certain ethnic minority might be more marginalized in, in one place. So equity and equality in the way that we use the terms, just to be clear, are not the same, but they're mutually supportive. So one um, equality chooses to focus on, on outcomes and um, equity is more about the processes that lead to those outcomes. At least that's how we use the words. So uh, we can use an example of that infamous couple, Bill and Melinda Gates, to illustrate this quite nicely. Um, so if you remember the list of attributes that I listed when I was talking about marginalization, and imagine each of those essentially is a hill that we all need to climb in, in life. So Bill at the top there, he's had a relatively easy life in terms of those things, at least. Uh, none of his social attributes were a huge mountain for him to climb in order for him to be or do the things he wanted to be or do. So he grew up a non-poor boy of a majority social class in a relatively wealthy and stable country with arguably decent governance, um, with good access to public services needed to thrive in society. Obviously, he also worked very hard. He was very clever. But none of these things on the slide really held him back from achieving <clears throat> that, that life. Um, and then Melinda in the middle row also had a pretty easy time. She was born into a similar set of circumstances to Bill, a majority group in a similar place with similar governance and demographics. The one difference, perhaps the one hill that Melinda had to climb is that she's a woman in a place where being a woman can still hold you back in some aspects of life. Um, and then at the bottom there, we've got Ava. So Ava is a girl who was born into a minority ethno-religious group in a rural, low-income country, uh, vulnerable to climate shocks and conflict. And for her, because of who she was born and the social and physical context she was born into, each of those small hills has really become a, a mountain to climb. So it doesn't mean, of course, that it's impossible for her to, to create a, a good life on her own terms. People do it. Um, but it does mean it's likely a whole lot harder. Um, and that also shows us something about this thing called intersectionality as well. So having to climb multiple hills, sometimes all at the same time, is harder than having to climb just one or two. So, I mean, I, I show this just to give an example, but really the idea is that equity or justice is changing the prevailing socio-political norms and structures to make each of those mountains smaller for everyone in every place. So that's the idea. So how have those ideas been used in research then to better uh, understand these issues? So when we were thinking about all this for food and nutrition, we wanted to lay the issues of marginalization and justice out in ways that were useful to researchers and to those taking action on food systems and nutrition. So first in uh, around 2019, we laid this out for nutrition in the nutrition equity framework. So in that, we say that uh, to understand what drives these sort of inequities in nutrition, the, the, the outcomes, um, to sustainably address their basic determinants, we need to understand what, what underpins them. So the easiest factors to see and to measure and maybe to understand um, are people's experience of their immediate food, health and care environments. And those are conditioned by people's own daily living conditions and behavioural choices. So those issues are fairly commonly discussed and researched or, or addressed in, in programmes and even policies. 
underlying opportunities to achieve those are people's social position in terms of gender or ethnicity or those other identities that condition marginalization or inclusion. And also the personal or group resources that people have to draw on in any given context and which also kind of accrue over multiple lifetimes. So their human capital and potential. And then underpinning those, the most uh, structural determinants of who is marginalized and therefore who most often ends up malnourished or, or with poor food security is a combination of the cultural ideas, norms and values in a given society, which shape who is placed kind of higher or, or lower in a social hierarchy. So how women are viewed or how different ethnicities are treated. And then how those crystallize into governance of those societies through institutions and structures. So the multiple interactions that occur between these things, between social position, human capital and the social and political environment, we conceptualize as driven by uh, this engine of inequity. So it's made up of injustice, unfairness and exclusion, which describe how cycles of marginalization and discrimination occur. And that engine of inequity draws on those ideas of justice or, or injustice in this case that I laid out before. So this framework of nutrition equity is based on other well-established frameworks, things like the social determinants of health. Um, but what it does, I think, is start to give us a logic of what we need to understand and what we need to then address if we recognize that these deep issues of marginalization, inequity and injustice have a direct conceptual link then to um, nutrition outcomes. So then a few years later, um, we were asked to think about what this means for food and, and food systems, so more, more broadly than, than nutrition. Um, and we drew on similar ideas so that inequalities in food security and nutrition outcomes towards the right of the figure are driven by underlying inequalities and inequities towards the left. And then we turned around that engine of inequity into an engine of equity saying that these things can be addressed. So the engine of equity says that what we need to make food systems more equitable is, again, those three forms of justice. So recognitional justice, um, which is the recognition of unfair difference between social groups, representational justice, which is the participation of those groups in decision making, and distributive justice, which is a more equitable distribution of um, resources and opportunities within and among groups. Uh, and then we additionally considered that those things can be addressed explicitly within food systems, but also in other related systems. So sometimes the health system for nutrition or the social protection system, that sort of thing. And that in order to address them, we should consider human rights principles. We should work to counter concentrated power in systems which keep them the same. We should work to uh, increase the agency of, of people, particularly marginalized people in and through these systems. And also recognize, um, this is perhaps more an academic point, but recognize the different knowledges, the different ways of knowing about these things that exist in such a, a complex and embedded issue. And then just a third framework, if you'll permit me very briefly, is um, how human rights map onto food systems. So this is from the People-Centered Food Systems Project, and I'll, I'll come back to rights a bit later and we can talk about it more if we want to. So in terms of research, uh, I want to demonstrate that we know less and less about these determinants as we go farther, further to the left of the framework, so towards those structural causes, which perhaps isn't news to people. Um, but a while back, we did a, a review asking that, asking how does agriculture, nutrition and health research address equity issues in low and middle income countries specifically? So all those ideas on equity and equality that we just uh, talked about, um, informed this study. And we found just under 250 papers that we mapped to look at how these studies addressed equity or equality. And this figure just brings the research together and shows uh, the density of research covering different topics. So in interpreting this, what we see is that there were most papers looking at unequal outcomes. So inequality of outcome based on things like social position. So somewhere in the middle of the framework. Mm -hmm. Um, the next most looked at material circumstances, the resources and assets that, that people had. And then the fewest papers looked at the structural determinants of inequity, things like the norms and values and, and broader social and political exclusion. So most papers looked at what the equity problem is. 
fewer looked at how that's shaped and fewer still looked at kind of why that inequity exists in, in the first place. So as an example, we tried to see if we could do research that considered the whole equity framework for a mixed method study of historical factors affecting stunting reduction in Vietnam. So uh, briefly, our starting place was that um, Vietnam has achieved quite significant progress in reducing undernutrition over the past several decades. It's held up as a regional example of what can be accomplished through uh, commitment to um, quite coherent policy across economic and social development, including nutrition. So among high income households, stunting fell from 21% to 6% um, up to 2010. But among low income households, the decline was from 52% to 41%. And what those figures mask um, is even more inequalities in outcomes. So in Vietnam, the poorest households tend to be ethnic minority households. So there's only 10% of the population still living below the poverty line in Vietnam, but 65% of those people belong to one of Vietnam's ethnic minority groups. Um, so ethnic minorities, and in particular, the, the sort of smaller minority groups in the central and northern highland regions, um, you can see on the map, have really fallen significantly behind in Vietnam's kind of rush to development. Um, and a large proportion of the remaining burden of stunting falls in those communities. And then uh, on the right there, you can see um, in that figure that um, uh, patterns of inequity are mirrored when looking at those underlying determinants of nutrition, where ethnic minorities have consistently worse um, access to infrastructure, access to services. And then the sociological work that formed the background to that showed clearly that um, the ways that ethnic minorities are framed in Vietnamese social structures has led historically and currently to this marginalization and then onwards through the framework to, to malnutrition. So this is not only an equity issue and an injustice, but it's also slowing Vietnam's overall rate of nutrition reduction, their overall rate of achieving some of those goals and sustainable development goals. So that was just one example, but in the uh, HLPE report uh, that was out last year, we reviewed hundreds of examples of research across disciplines, across sectors for, for food systems, and we found some clear patterns. So inequalities exist everywhere. This isn't just a low and middle income country issue. Um, they uh, exist across those known axes of marginalization that I was talking about. Um, and they're increasing, but also decreasingly uh, differently in, in different contexts. So these things do play out differently and context really does matter. Um, consistently marginalized groups in the literature are those we've talked about. Um, and again, very context specific, but um, some of them are across contexts. And again, most systemic inequities are rooted in these power imbalances in social norms and governance structures. Um, and these, so, because they're embedded, they will persist unless they're explicitly challenged and, and changed. Um, and in the research, of course, there's gaps and issues. So uh, looking even at outcomes, data is often not disaggregated. It's rarely intersectional. Um, and there isn't as much acknowledgement as there could be of different forms of evidence, different ways of knowing that can reveal um, different layers of, of inequality and inequity. Okay, so a whistle stop tour of the research, but what do those ideas and evidence suggest we should actually do then about inequity? So there are sets of principles. So people working on equity have determined sets of sort of equity principles to work by. So this is a set of principles from that same HLPE report. So they include things like focusing explicitly on inequalities and the reasons for those, not just assuming they will be dealt with, but focusing explicitly on them. Um, ensuring policies and programs, again, explicitly work on those recognition, representation and redistribution aspects from the engine of equity. Um, focusing on the most marginalized groups in any context. Um, and taking some bolder transformative actions alongside incremental actions, um, including ones that are multi-duty, so addressing several aspects of equity at once. So those are some broad principles to work by. You can certainly look at more in the HLP report. 
So those sets of principles give some kind of broad brush ideas on what we can consider for action then. So here I want to bring back um, human rights into the discussion as well, because rights and equity, they're not the same thing, but they they work towards similar goals and they they kind of fill gaps in each other. So equity, for instance, has a focus on redistribution that rights doesn't really have. So that reference to equality of opportunities and resources, um, whereas rights have an additional focus on things like accountability and transparency, and in particular, the focus on using law to strengthen kind of development aspirations into people's entitlements. So bringing rights in as well, um, we can distill those ideas that we've talked about into perhaps four main areas for action. So both rights and equity approaches uh, would require the most marginalized, discriminated and excluded groups to be recognized. So in terms of the social attributes that make them marginalized and the social reasons for that in context. And both approaches require the representation of those groups in making decisions that affect them. So that might be in policy making, might be in, in development programming, might be in research design. So an equity approach requires an explicit focus on redistribution. So not just a bare minimum, but a more equal chance at achieving a, a good life. Uh, and then a rights approach would enable things like the strength of the law and the accountability that go, can go with that. So we have potentially four R's, redistribution, recognition, representation, and rights. And I'm not suggesting that those are all kind of separate and highly interlinked, but perhaps it makes a, an easier way to remember them. And I'm not suggesting that they're necessarily the only ways to work, but we, we found them as, as useful ideas to work through. So for each of the four R's, there are lots of different ways of working towards them, but I'll give a few examples and then perhaps we can discuss if that was useful. So in terms of recognition, that obviously there are different ways of bringing attention to who is being marginalized and why. Uh, sometimes the groups themselves get together and demand to be seen through protest. Sometimes people representing those groups find their way into uh, policy processes or, or other processes and make change that way. Uh, another way of revealing who is marginalized and, and getting recognition for that is through data and evidence. So given that that's my focus today, I'll focus on that. So in the example I gave before on Vietnam, we wanted to highlight that ethnic minority groups in Vietnam were facing worse food security and nutrition outcomes than the ethnic majority. So the first thing we did is disaggregate outcome data by ethnic group, so that the bar chart on the top left there. And we can clearly see, of course, that ethnic minorities in orange um, and some groups in particular are doing significantly worse on child stunting than the majority, which is in green. Um, and then we did the same for the known socioeconomic determinants of malnutrition on that chart below. Um, so there are ways of using um, data and evidence to uh, further equity. So in Vietnam, we were lucky that the government was aware of the issue and, and collected uh, data disaggregated by ethnicity already to be able to track that. But of course, other countries don't do that. Uh, they don't figure out who their most marginalized groups are and, and explicitly um, disaggregate data so they can see that. Um, and many research projects even don't. Um, so addressing uh, equity and data and evidence at the very minimum requires sensibly disaggregated uh, quantitative data. Um, Another way uh, to it could be to ensure that um, research and evidence captures and applies the perspectives of marginalized groups themselves and that they're involved, as I say, in research design that concerns concerns them. So that might include different kinds of research, qualitative also. Did someone have a question? No. Could everybody mute? Sorry, there's some uh, voices coming. Um, okay, I'll carry on. Um, and okay, so thirdly, a lot of research comes from a Western tradition, of course, but there are other ways of rigorously understanding the world. So we need to value those approaches too. So just some ways to get towards the recognition aspect of equity and rights. Second would be representation. So that relates to marginalized groups or their proper representatives, maybe civil society groups having a voice in decision making that affects them. So whether it's policy or projects or local community decisions. So some people call that participation. 
um, whatever you call it, whether people can participate or be represented in those processes is a lot about power. So we can uh, focus explicitly on power. So this uh, slide shows the power cube, which is quite a useful way of understanding power for participation. So there are different levels of power that we might need to understand to understand who is represented and who isn't. So the international, national, local, and lots of layers of power within the local level. There are different spaces in which power is enacted. So those might be uh, decision-making arenas and forums for action. And sometimes those spaces are closed to certain groups. Um, sometimes certain groups may be invited to participate by authorities. Um, and occasionally, of course, people mobilize and claim a space in order to be represented. Um, and then there are different forms of power. So power that's visible in public processes, power that's hidden by sort of creating barriers to participation, perhaps, um, and power that's almost invisible because I mean, people are, are not even aware that there are other ways of acting. So uh, just briefly, I did an analysis of power in Zambia's food and nutrition policy process, and it did clearly show that the power did not lie with communities, which again won't be a surprise, but it's sometimes nice to see it empirically. And that certain spaces were just closed to certain groups and that different forms of language or even resource limitations limited representation. So to work towards representation, we need to ask who is excluded in each of those ways and how that can be overcome in context. And there's a couple of links there with with um, resources on, on how to do that. The redistribution aspect. So addressing the systemic drivers of inequity in food systems requires asking why opportunities and resources are, are distributed in the way they are, and then how redistribution of those can be achieved uh, in favour of, of marginalised groups. Um, what held those groups back from reaching their potential. So policies might include things like strengthening land tenure, supporting marginalised food system workers, um, ensuring that social protection reaches groups previously, perhaps not recognized as marginalized. So an example that's often given is Brazil. Um, so between 2003 and 2014, several public policies um, that led to quite significant results in reducing poverty and food insecurity were implemented. Um, things like uh, targeting of um, poor urban families, women, um, small family farmers, indigenous people, um, but there was kind of a, I suppose you could call it a natural experiment around 2015 with a change of government. There were drastic budget cuts and institutional destructuring, and those actions were practically extinguished. And you can, to some extent, see the effects of those policy changes um, in the food insecurity numbers on the graph. At least academics have, have linked the two. Um, so food insecurity going down as the progressive policies were implemented and then up when they were stopped. So making progressive policy sensitive to equity means making sure it works specifically for the most uh, marginalized groups. And then lastly, uh, rights. So human rights have um, three aspects in terms of what they might be. They can be legal aspects, uh, policy and sort of rhetorical aspects, and often an advocacy or, or practice aspect. And it's not easy to provide a simple um, example with rights, but there is the case of India, which is one of the most well-known right to food cases. So uh, although aspects of nutrition had always been in the Indian constitution since independence, um, it was included in a way that meant it, people couldn't take it to court. People couldn't uh, take government to court if it wasn't fulfilled. So nothing was really being done for decades. Um, it wasn't a priority. It wasn't a legal duty. So in 2001, an advocacy group brought public litigation, arguing that the government was not fulfilling the right to life or the right to food. Um, and the Supreme Court of India agreed and required the government to make legally binding policy. So an act that can't easily be undone then by by subsequent governments. And so the right to food act turned policy responses that might be overturned by successive governments into legal entitlements for Indian citizens. Um, so it included rights to work, to subsidize food and to nutritious school meals for, for children. And there are monitoring bodies within India working towards accountability. So this sort of process um, can, yeah, can, can give a, um, can turn sort of policies into duties. So it, what rights brings is a strengthening of those 
equity aspects. It brings them into the law, makes them entitlements rather than handouts, and it adds hopefully an element of monitoring and accountability, turning yeah, actions into duties. So what some of those examples show is that we need to be working sometimes quite far outside of food systems, actually, or outside of nutrition policy to address some aspects of inequity that are relevant to, to food systems. Um, obviously, there are plenty of actions within food systems and related systems, too. So in the HLPE report, there's a whole section um, in the last chapter um, that bring more explicit ideas to addressing inequities across uh, systems for food security and nutrition. So there's a table of recommendations and for each recommendation, we tried to show whether the action works mostly on recognition, representation or redistribution. And of course, the strongest actions will often work on, on all three. And ideally, each of those needs to be considered and refined in context, considering who is marginalized in that context and then focus on addressing uh, equity structurally to improve the agency of those groups over their lives. So trying to move from those fairly conceptual ideas through evidence and research to some um, more concrete recommendations, acknowledging that they will always be context specific and they always need to be thought about um, in context. But there's uh, quite a lot now of, of, of recommendations and practical actions out there that do explicitly try to address equity. So that's, I think, where where we've got to so far on um, equity and equality in food systems and nutrition. Um, I'd love to hear um, what you've all been doing and if any of this sounds uh, relevant to you. So I, I think we've got some time for questions and discussion. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jodie. And uh, I've got to invite questions. If you can, you know, put up your virtual hand, or if you just want to jump straight in, that's that's also okay. Um, but I might uh, kick off with a question, Jody. And uh, I suppose it's around the political challenge, particularly, um, you know, when I mean, you take the case of Vietnam there, and it is the minority ethnic groups who are the most marginalized but tackling as with the political challenge in directing more resources to the marginalized groups um it's a hard nut to crack mm. yeah and well in vietnam they're not they have gone further than others perhaps surprisingly at, at recognizing that that's an issue they've set up um, commissions, they have specific policies to try to address some of this, um, even some resources going towards those. What we found hasn't been happening systematically is inclusion of minority voices in framing those policies. So there are some things in the policies that perhaps uh, don't address the, the risks and the issues that, that some, of, some in these groups sort of see themselves. So in that case, it's a question of building on some quite strong start by the government and, um, and saying, OK, but here are some things we could tweak to, to, to make that even better if you're serious about addressing this. I think another thing to do is, is it's how you frame it to government. So, for instance, again, in the, in the Vietnam case, the fact that ethnic minorities are being left so far behind on something like stunting reduction is a drag on the numbers that the government's able to report in terms of its general um, uh, achievement, right, of, of SDGs or of whatever other social indicators that the government cares about. So it's always going to be the most marginalised groups who are doing worse in these outcomes and therefore are the, the drag on, on the indicators. So if you've got a government that, that cares about its, you know, the way it looks in international targets or the international community, um, framing it in that way could be the, another approach. Sometimes the government just won't care. And, and in those cases, you know, there are other ways that these communities can, can mobilize and, and try and show their, their rights. But that's maybe not something that the development community gets involved in very often. Um, so yeah, I think I think there are ways. It, of course, it's a it's an aspirational project and it's a long term project, but I think there are some really quite practical ways to do that as well. And some of the recommendations in the HLPE report, for instance, 
when you look at them, they probably chime quite nicely with, um, you know, policy plans and, and national strategies that, that governments would have. Sometimes it just needs a bit of tweaking, not in the what you do, but in the, the how you do it. Are there ways of bringing in, you know, you, you already want to bring in a, a subsidy or something. Are there ways of working with um, different groups to get those voices in terms of how that could be nuanced to work better on equity? So, yeah, I think I think there are ways um, doesn't always work, but there are ways. I know the the stark example, I suppose, of, of Brazil and what happened with the political change there, I think is quite, um, you know, it probably also speaks to what's happened to marginalized groups. OK, questions, comments. Um, Monica, I'll come in there. Very, yeah. th thanks very much, Jodie. That's really brilliant. And, you know, Jodie, what, what kind of hits me sometimes is that, you know, you're coming at a programme, like it's impossible to do everything. Isn't that correct? I mean, you know, looking at all aspects of that and trying to bring in all of it, looking at the power cube, looking at the national, regional, all the different levels, equity, like sometimes I suppose I feel a bit overwhelmed, you know, because I know it, it demands systems change. I understand that. But we're kind of working at the level of, well, we want to increase women's position in society and we kind of focus in on that. But we can't seem to get at the systems bit of it, if you get me. And that whole intersectionality. And I, I guess sometimes I just feel, God, it's just so complicated. So I suppose when we come at it, I, maybe we have to see what part we can play. And you can't do, like, would you be suggesting we should be doing all aspects of this in our programming? Are we focusing on what we can achieve and others do other aspects. Do you get me? Because I do, it, I do. It can be overwhelming, you know. Yeah. yeah. And what can I ask Mary what your what organization you're with or what your position yeah, is, just course. so I know the context of your question. Sure. I, I work with Self Help Africa. Mm. So like a lot of work with farmers, a lot of work around enterprise, all of that, the value chain, that whole area, equity within the value chain, trying to get better outcomes for women, increase their agency, their voice, choice and control, their economic independence, etc. But often we can't be like, you know, looking back at like government at, at that level and doing very strong advocacy. It's, it's difficult, you know, to capture everything. I suppose mm. I'm listening to you today, recognizing all of this needs to be done. But yeah, so a little, you know, we're we're a medium sized organization. And I suppose, practically speaking, you know, we want to look at all these aspects, but, you know, you have donors demands as well and objectives to yes, meet. Yes, always an issue. Yeah. You, you have budget constraints and time and resources. So, yeah, I'm just putting that out. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 a really important point. I think it's often very acutely felt by those of us who work at global level because you're trying to you're trying to see this stuff in 20 different places at once and 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 we know that it's going to be different there to there. So one of the things I think we can do is focus in more on context and it might not be something that those of us who are at the global level can do. But you know, if you're working in Vietnam or you're working in Zambia or you're working in Brazil, there will be some of those things that kind of bubble to the surface as the most pressing thing or the most important thing, which is sometimes hard for us to see from from our sort of global bird's eye view. But the people in the country will will know. And, and let's say even not the national people, but the again, the marginalized groups. So ensuring that they have some participation in framing what it is that that you do. And yeah, within the structure of what what the program's going to do and what the donor has said they want. But saying, OK, here's the universe of things we could do. Let's say that's what my presentation was. But within that context, what are the one or two things that most pressingly need to be done there and for that for that group? So we, we often talk about participation, contextualization. We don't often do it for good reasons. It's really hard to do in the development world that we work in. But genuinely, for equity, it's almost impossible to do it without doing some kind of genuinely, you know, genuinely doing that for, it's so much about context, I think. Um, the other thing is, is timeline, time frame. It, it um, you know, these things are longer term. The further to the left of those frameworks you get, the, the longer term social processes they are, you know, um, look at even Ireland or England and women's rights or something, you know, these are intergenerational issues. So, um, 
yeah, those context and time timeline, I would say, uh, yeah. Buddy, a question here in the chat about, uh, you mentioned that you saw some countries or projects undertake bold transformative actions. Examples, could you give us any examples? Because I think, you know, grounded practical examples are good. And then I'll come to Ernan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what we saw, said in the report is that countries need to take those rather than that we have good examples. But I think the India example was one, you know, the the right to food movement in India, which yet, you know, took a lot of time, um, but worked through a lot of those principles, including the rights principles and embedded change so that it can take time. Because the Brazil example, right, you saw the, here's some good policies, oh, suddenly they've gone, oh, they're back again. If you take the India case, they're, they're embedded. It's very hard for governments to, to suddenly not, not do those if they're embedded in the law. Um, some countries manage to not do them, but um, if you're at the same time educating citizens on what their rights are, then there's a perhaps a nicer interplay that is more sort of structural and long-term and allows you the space to to keep working over the the long term, so maybe maybe India would be my example then in that in that one specific thing, not in everything. <laughs> okay, I have three hands up, so I go Ernan, then Sinead, then Stephen. Ernan, you're on mute there. Thanks very much, uh, Monica. Hi. Um, <clears throat> actually, both Stephen and Sinead were up before me. Oh, were they? I saw you first, Ernan. <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much for that. Um, um, Jody, thanks very much. Very interesting um, presentation. Um, <clears throat> kind of the, the uh, and lots of detail and um, on the different aspects and drivers of uh, inequity and inequality and the relationship between them. Um, but, uh, you know, I can't help thinking, um, you know, that there's a big question. Uh, that's out there that, um, uh, you know, we've been struggling with for a long time. You know, um, the, well, the first thing I would ask is, is you know, so, so the problems we have of uh, food insecurity, food and nutrition insecurity and inequity, uh, and all of those negative outcomes and growing inequity, in fact, and growing inequality uh, within countries, particularly, although we're always told that equality between countries is improving, but within them, it's actually uh, deteriorating. Um, when, I, when I look at a piece of research like yours, I wonder, um, is, the, is, is the fact that we do so badly with this, is that due to our lack of understanding of the problem or lack of analysis? Do you know, is this type of work really critical to solving the problem? Uh, or, or is it um, worthwhile things that we feel we have to do in order to better understand it? In other words, is our, our like us, the sort of people who are in this, uh, who are in this uh, seminar, is our lack of understanding or uh, actually the problem that's uh, driving this or by improving or the other way around if we do the sort of work that you're proposing I mean lots of sorry lots of the measures recommendations are perfectly valid absolutely but do we really need to continue repeating this type of analysis uh, in in order to uh, or will that improve the situation is it the lack of more and more analysis and more and more research is that what the problem is what I don't get from this type of work is why have we failed you know, um, if you if you think back, like we're in the end, we're halfway through, more than halfway through the SDGs time frame. Uh, we we had the MDGs, you know, with a fifteen year or more time frame of its own. You know, and before we were halfway through the MDGs, we already knew all of these things. Really, you know, all all of the problems around how we weren't performing, how the uh, uh, the outcomes were uh, were um, not. Uh, what we wanted, uh, grossly unequal, um, uh, all of that we knew. I mean, you remember the food, 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 fuel and financial crisis, uh, the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative, the G8, the G20, uh, and all of that stuff um, uh, that, that went on there. And still, you know, we didn't. We didn't manage it, and to me, that's the thing that I don't that I don't get. You know, what what is the um, uh, is there value in this? I understand that in a way it's kind of 
uh, important. Okay, uh, hang on. I'm going to throw it back to Jody here for a quick sorry. two response to that. In other words, is it that we don't know, or is it that we don't care, or is it that we don't do? <laughs> yes, but, but just just before, before you do, if you we did a piece of analysis, I remember years ago, looking at the allocation of uh, development uh, ODA resources. matched need you know uh, across global and really of course you would all their development assistance across the world uh you know in an equitable way but when you look at the aggregate of what everybody spends it doesn't really focus on where on where where the problems are we knew this back in 2008 uh, we know already with the sdgs that we're in exactly the same place we're failing completely in terms of uh, delivering for the marginalised and the poor. So okay. why is that? Quick response from Jody on that. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a, a quick response kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> um, partly, are we measuring the right things in in, in the, the right kinds of disaggregated ways in those SDGs? Are we even aiming for the right things? Is, is inequality and inequity central enough? Are our global systems, uh, you know, the global economic system set up is set up in a way that that does tend to embed um, inequality. Um, the time frames of of the way that we're trying to address those things are, you know, we've just talked about these being generational issues, um, and even a fifteen year time frame of of the SDGs, even though it's much better than a standard three year time frame of a of a project, you know, is is already too short. I think the SDGs fragment things a lot into how many targets are there? 50, 100? I don't know. Um, so so having that, um, you know, coherent, you know, should we have an overarching focus on the inequality and inequity piece? But I think in terms of the research, it depends on context. So at a global level, we probably don't need many more frameworks and things telling us how these things happen in theory. In some countries, we probably don't need much more work telling us which groups are marginalized, um, although sometimes having the data shown in your face, you know, makes people unable to ignore it anymore. Um, but I do think we do not so well on the representation piece. So the um, having people who are experiencing these things actually have input into our programming, our resource allocation, national policy, whatever the thing is that you work in, I genuinely, I genuinely think that we we would do better in what we're trying to do if we if we did that. Um, and then yeah, the redistribution and rights are you know even less considered. So there's a quick okay, answer to a much more complex I, question. I, I, you got that nice and sharp. I'm going to come to Sinead and then to Stephen. We're in our last five minutes, so I'll get you to be brief with the questions and Sinead, you first. Thanks very much, Monica. And thank you very much, Jody, as well. That was really interesting. Um, th this is actually kind of building off uh, Ernan's question as well. It, relating to social sustainability, I was wondering if, if you found any use or value in conceptualizing any of this around the third pillar of social sustainability. And the reason I'm asking is because because it doesn't really seem to mean much other than health when we're looking at the three pillars of sustainability and I'm attempting I'm working in Zambia and Vietnam actually amongst other countries at the moment with Sustainable Food Systems Ireland um, as a way of approaching and communicating this um, having the three pillars I find is quite simple when we're talking about what does it mean to take a, a systems approach which is one of the things that comes up um, but then my question ends up being does social sustainability really matter? What, what is it? And if it's things like culture, indigenous knowledge, representation, if it is, I've yet to really see representation or justice as part of social sustainability, hence my question to you, is it really important and should it be given a little bit less weight um, when we're talking about hunger or, or malnutrition um, more broadly? Uh, so yeah, in terms of conceptualization, if you've come across it, if you find any value in it, and in terms of the concepts you're talking about, how you measure and, and track those things um, would be my question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know these pillars. I don't know what the pillar of social sustainability is. So I'm not sure how well I'll be able to answer. Um, I think they're the issues of social sustainability, if, if you're talking about what I've just been talking about, are fundamental because 
the people who are furthest behind hold us back in all of those other uh, indicators, quite apart from it being an injustice in, in the first place. So I don't know if I've answered your question because I don't know what the pillars are, but I'd be happy to, to chat more offline. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Stephen, last question to you. Uh, yeah, OK, well, actually, my my question has been covered a little bit as well, but thank you very much, Jody. That was a really fascinating talk. And I love the the framework that you've given us there, uh, you know, starting off with the 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 whole kind of well, I mean, the, the, the way that the rights uh, then link in with the, rec the the three R's of the recognition or representation and redistribution. I'd say on rights, I mean, I, I, I think it is a key thing. And I, I think the India example is a really good one. And then, you know, the problem, of course, as Monica was pointing out, the whole poli political challenge around this is the is the policy coherence that we we face with, you know, challenges from our own countries to India's uh, food, uh, food distribution system in, you know, trying trying to defend their right to food act. And yet, you know, we have so many uh, strange things going on in the WTO and our other institutions that seem to undermine that. Um, but I really, uh, I suppose one of the areas that I was going to try and focus on was the recognitional aspect of it all and whether we have the right indicators. And, you, you know, I, I do, uh, you know, sometimes I know many of us get frustrated at the IPC at the moment, you know, in terms of how it's identifying famine uh, at times and whether we're able to actually, you know, kind of, and, and, and whether they have the right indicators is really difficult for them. We had uh, Jenny Armstrong last year come and give a talk to us, you know, about how difficult it is to actually make those kind of decisions about who is, um, you know, who are the marginalised in, in different kind of circumstances. So so we understand the challenges. But I just wonder that we, as a community, we should be putting more into uh, actually finding out what people are, are really eating, you know, and, and identifying uh, the micronutrient deficiencies and everything, rather than relying on the anthropometrics and the diversity, you know, indicators that we've been using for so long that, that don't always, uh, you know, don't always add up. But, I, you know, that's a, that's a separate area. And and I do agree, Jody, that I think the real key thing is the representation um, issue, um, you know, in, in, in there that, that we, we really haven't done enough on that to make it make this a more participatory process so that the marginalised have much more power in determining, you know, their, um, yeah. their, their right to food. Um, so those yeah. are some comments because I, it... <laughs> no, thank you. It's, yeah. So, I mean, it, nobody's pretending that this is easy. Many of you have been working on this for far longer than I have, but the, I think bringing some of these ideas that already exist in other areas of development or, or, um, or policy more clearly into the work that we do on food and nutrition can give us a, a, a lens to work through or a, a more clear rationale to work on inequality and inequity. And I agree, Sinead, also I, I missed your point on, on what do we measure um, and also Stevens. But I think disaggregating the quantitative outcome data is a really easy one that's so often not done. Um, as you get further into things like accountability, then yeah, that gets trickier. We're working on that in the People-Centered Food Systems Project and Sometimes, as I say, you've got to take other types of knowledge, not just numbers, but qualitative work, people's lived experience of their lives that can also be captured empirically and, and strongly if done well. So, um, yeah, those are, are just some final thoughts because so many issues have been raised and this is a much longer conversation. But, um, yeah, I do see progress in our little field of food and nutrition um, in thinking about this stuff, and perhaps we have um, things that we can also pass on to other sectors. So, yeah, thank you, Monica. I'll leave it there. I know we're over time. I think a big virtual round of applause to Jody for, I think, a very stimulating uh, presentation. And I think, you know, a lot for us to, to think about um, and, and talk about. And I think we'll be following your work uh, closely uh, because I think, you know, looking at whether or not we have the right indicators, but certainly this disaggregation and really looking at who is marginalised, what that experience of marginalisation is like, and what does it look like from, from the perspective of the poor. So before bringing things to a close, a big thank you also to Patrice for all the organising. And she has also 
put the details for next Wednesday's webinar, which is uh, Beware of Systems, Reflections on the Future of Food Systems Governance uh, with Jessica Duncan from Wageningen University. So I think that will also be a very interesting uh, webinar. And Jody, we will keep up to date with, with what you're doing and, and read your your research as it comes out. And yeah, please get in touch if there's, you know, if further uh, discussions are interesting. Absolutely. And finally, a big thank you to all the participants. I think you have made it very engaging and uh, well done to all of you. Thank you.